Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Abigail Hickok, who will be telling us about persistence diagram bundles, a multidimensional generalization of vineyards. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to talk about this is like some recent work. Um, so I'm going to start with just persistent homology, like plain old vanilla persistent homology. I, I know that probably everyone here knows this, but I think it's helpful to establish some notation. Um, so, you know, the idea is we have like a point cloud or some, you know, data in some form, uh, we're constructing filtration. Here I have the view torus strips filtration, so I'm increasing this scale parameter, R, um, and in this way I get a nested sequence of simplicial complexes, a filter complex. <laughs> so that's very nice, but what happens if I don't just have a scale parameter, but maybe multiple parameters are varying? So like, for example, here I have this is a multi-agent dynamical system, so a point cloud that's varying over time. Um, and you can see, these are not my images, but they're very nice. Um, you can see over time here, there's sort of different topological features forming. Um, you know, you can see this sort of annulus forming over time. And so at every time, we could construct, say, a Viator surface filtration, and we get this, you know, filtration at every time t. And so there's already a nice way of dealing with this special case, it's a vineyard. So if I have some sort of time varying filtration, where at every time t I have a filtration, we can then uh, compute persistent homology at every time and we get a vineyard. Here, you know, what we're doing is we're sort of stacking up all those persistent diagrams at every time. Um, so here at the bottom, we have the persistence diagram for the point cloud at, at time zero, and it's just sort of varying as time goes on. The points in the persistence diagram are tracing out these curves here. These are the vines in a vineyard. Uh, see, Renata has a question. Yeah, just a quick question. So what is uh, red and blue here, They're different colors? Oh, um, so here the points are moving either like clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, so it's it's just distinguishing which direction they're moving in. Okay. So, okay, so, but of course you can imagine Imagine that your point cloud might be varying over not just time, but like other parameters. So, for example, in that uh, multi agent dynamical system, there are other system parameters involved. Um, so, here is a snapshot. Again, this is not from my paper, um, but uh, we have this again, the same multi agent dynamical system, and it's not just varying over time, but there are sort of parameters that control the dynamics. And you can see that the sort of topological features that show up vary depending on those parameters. So here, we're not just looking at things in position space, but position velocity space. So all of these point clouds here, which are snapshots from different parameters, all have different topological signatures. Like on the left here, everything's moving in the same direction. Uh, in the middle, some things are moving uh, counterclockwise, some are moving clockwise. And on the right, uh, things are all moving outwards. So we might be interested in looking at how um, the topology of this multi-agent dynamical system varies over not just time, but over these different system parameters. And so at every, let's say there's just one system parameter mu. So at every time t and every mu, I could construct, say, the via strips filtration um, and get this, you know, filtration for every t and every mu. And in general, you know, we can't just use multi-parameter resistant homology here uh, because it's just simply not a multi-filtration in general. In general, for like two different pairs of, you know, T1, mu1, T2, mu2, um, in general, there's just no reason that it would be guaranteed for one to be a subset of the other, even if T2 is bigger than T1 and mu2 is bigger than mu1. So this is the motivation for why we need something like a persistence diagram bundle. So, uh, I'm now going to switch over. Instead of talking about nested sequence of simple shell complexes, I'm just going to describe filtered complexes by a filtration function. So we're looking at the sublevel filtration. Um, so for a persistence diagram bundle, we're looking at fibered filtration functions, which are um, a set of filtration functions that vary over some base space, which I just require to be some topological space. So here we're filtering. Um, some simplicial complex KT, which may or may not vary over the base space. Um, in most of the examples and things that I'm going to be talking about today, we're going to assume that KT here, the simplicial complex that we're filtering, is not varying over the base space. So an example would be like that point cloud that's varying over different parameters and times. Um, in that case, if we were making, say, the Viator filtration, 
um, k here would just be the simplicial complex that has a simplex for every subset of vertices, and that's not varying over the base space. The filtration of it might, but the actual simplicial complex k that we're filtering is not. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I define the, the total space of this persistence diagram bundle to be just the space of persistence diagrams as it varies over the base space. Um, and here we can give this the subspace topology because it's um, a, a subset of uh, the product of the base space with uh, the extended plane because every persistence diagram bundle is just a subset of that. And I'm sort of ignoring the fact here that persistence diagrams are multi-sets, not sets, but we're just going to treat this as a set. Okay, and so then I define the persistence diagram bundle to be this triple of the total space, the base space, and the projection back down to the um, base space. And I'm, I'm purposely like suggestively using the language of fiber bundles, but maybe it's important to point out that this is not actually a fiber bundle. Um, for, for one, uh, the fibers are not constant over the base space. You know, points in a persistence diagram can converge together or merge into the diagonal. So suggestively like a fiber bundle, but it's it's not really. Okay, so some special cases are, uh, of course, a vineyard is a special case where the base space is just the real numbers or maybe an interval in the real numbers, um, because here uh, our filtration is just varying over an, an interval in R. Um, another special case is the persistent homology transform. So here my base space is uh, a sphere. So uh, what we're doing here, if you are not familiar with the persistent homology transform is we have some shape in our d plus one here. Um, and for every point in the sphere, we have some vector and we're filtering, we're doing like the height filtration with respect to that direction. So here I have a figure from one of Liz Munch's papers about barley seeds, uh, where you can see the shape is this barley seed and here this purple vector is a point in the sphere and we're just filtering um, in that direction. And we're doing that for every point in the sphere. So this is a special case of a persistence diagram bundle where the base space is maybe less trivial. Okay, uh, another, another special case is the fiber barcode. And I don't want people to get confused between fiber barcodes and persistence diagram bundles, but the fiber barcode is technically a special case. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, we're looking at, um, if I'm given some n-dimensional persistence module, um, we're looking at the space of lines with a parameterization of this form. So for example, if I have a 2D persistence module, I'm just looking at lines with positive slope or, or including vertical lines. And uh, for every line in this space, uh, there is a filter complex. We just take the filtration here. And the fiber barcode is just the map that sends one of these lines to the barcode or persistence diagram for that filter complex. So this is an example of a persistence diagram bundle whose base space is the space of lines. And um, maybe unlike my previous examples, this space, the simplicial complex that we're filtering over, that we're filtering, is not constant over the base space, um, which also means that a lot of what I'm going to say in the rest of this talk doesn't really apply here, but things are sort of similar. Okay, so there's sort of a lot of data floating around here, and some of it is redundant. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to decompose this into some simpler parts that, that we can actually work with it. So first, we're just going to uh, briefly return back to normal persistent homology. Um, and I'm going to remind people uh, of, of how we look at persistent homology. So if I were to compute a persistence diagram for this filtration here, uh, what I would do is I would compute the birth and death simplex pairs. Uh, and you can do this one of the standard ways is you can compute what's called an RU decomposition of the boundary matrix. Um, so for those who don't know what birth and death simplices are, I'll, I can give you an example. So here, uh, here I have um, a nested sequence of simplicial complexes. There's just one 1D uh, homology class here. It's right here, or one generator. Um, and it's born here at two when I add the edge from zero to three. So that's the birth simplex, it creates the class. Um, and it dies over here at four when I add the triangle with vertices zero, two, and three. So that triangle is called the death simplex because it destroys the class. And 
then for every birth and deaths in Bucks Fair, my persistence diagram has a point yeah. whose um, coordinates are the yeah. filtration function evaluated on that birth and death in Bucks Fair. Okay, so um, the, the key takeaway here is that a persistence diagram is just determined by its birth and death symbolics, plus their filtration values. So what we can do is we can sort of stratify the base space in a nice way. So maybe a key fact that would be obvious if you if I told you how to compute birth and death simplices, um, which would be that um, the birth and death simplex pairs only depend on the ordering of the simplices, the, the ordering like as induced by the filtration function. So if I, and that's, and that's because if the order doesn't change, the boundary matrix doesn't change. So if I were to like perturb the filtration function a little bit and the order didn't change, then my birth and death simplices also wouldn't change. So what we can do is in the generic case, you know, some caveats, uh, we, can, we, can we can stratify the base space so that within each of those like top dimensional stratum, the simplex ordering is constant, which also means that the birth and death simplex pairs are constant. So I'll give you um, a really simple example. So let's imagine that my base space is just the plane or maybe a subset of the plane, um, like R2. Um, and let's say that the filtration values of my simplices are linear. So that means that for any given simplex, um, its filtration functions as they vary over the base space, that's just linear. So if I look at the filtration functions for any two simplices, I get like the intersection of two planes. Um, and if I project their intersection back down to the base space, I get a line or, or, or maybe, you know, an empty six intersection. Um, and so if I do this for all pairs, I get something that looks like this. So here I have some line arrangement. And if I look at any point that, you know, within one of these polygons, that's not touching any of these lines, um, the order of the simplices within this polygon is not changing. And so the birth and death simplices are constant within this polygon. So every persistence diagram for every point within this polygon has the same birth and death simplices. So you can sort of think of those birth and death simplex pairs as like a template that you can use within this whole polygon. And so we get this nice partition here in this case into polygons um, where within each polygon, the birth and death simply are constant. And so in general, uh, maybe we don't have lines here. Yeah, I see, does Fukuno, do you have a question? Or just, okay, sorry. Um, okay, so in general, maybe we don't have lines, but um, we have maybe generically, uh, if, if my base space T is like n-dimensional, Maybe maybe an a smooth n-dimensional compact manifold, like the nicest possible space. Uh, then generically, you know, instead of having lines, we now have like n minus one dimensional manifolds. Um, and you know, generically, like things intersect nicely. Um, and so you get this nice stratification generically. Okay, so now I want to talk about some sort of like interesting structure that shows up in persistence diagram bundles that doesn't really show up in uh, vineyards. So uh, here I'm gonna define uh, a global section in the same way that you define it for a bundle. So uh, if I have a persistence diagram bundle with this total space E, base space T and project and pi, um, I'm just looking at maps from the base space into the total space where um, S of T is always in the persistence diagram for T. So if I have a vineyard, um, this is sort of this is sort of trivial because uh, you know if I take any point uh, in the total space here like where my mass is you know I can always extend this you know any a, a global a section or a global section is just a parameterization of one of these vines um, and even if two of those vines intersect you can still like maybe in a non-unique way um, take one of these points and extend it to a global section so things are sort of trivial in this case but in a persistence diagram bundle, that's not really the case. Global sections may not even exist at all. So I'll show you. Um, I'll show you an example. And Abby, a question here. So you sort of have um, the diagonal appearing with infinite multiplicity. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I am including the diagonal. 
yeah, so it's it's okay if you know it merge it might merge back into the diagonal. That's okay. Thanks. Okay, so I'll show you an example. So here's my simplicial complex K. This is what we're going to be filtering over the whole base space. Um, and the simple C's labeled A, B, C, and D, those are the ones that we actually care about. So let's say I have a fiber filtration function where my base space is just R2. Um, and I'm just going to assume that my filtration, the filtration values for all the all the simplicities that aren't A, B, C, and D, those filtration values are all less than A, B, C, and D. Um, C, C, and D are always bigger than A and B. And what we're doing here is um, the filtration value for A is bigger than B on the top half of the plane. It's less than in the bottom half of the plane. Um, C is bigger than D on the right half of the plane here. And then the filtration value for C is less than D on the left half of the plane here. Okay, and you can see here, we have this like nice stratification where, um, the simplex ordering is constant in each one of these quadrants. So that means that the birth and death simplices are constant in each of these quadrants. So I've written here the birth and death simplices for the one dimensional homology. Um, so here, this means that in the first quadrant, A is always creating a, a homology class that C kills, B is creating a homology class that D kills in this whole quadrant. And so if we look at the persistence diagram bundle. So here on the right, I'm just plotting like some of the fibers. So I'm plotting persistence diagrams for um, a sample of points from the circle. So one and nine come from the same point. Uh, I just couldn't put them in the same place. Uh, they're both coming from, from right here. And I'm also showing you that at the center here, we have this sort of like singularity uh, where we have a point here with multiplicity one. And I'm here, I'm just showing you the one dimensional uh, persistent homology. So the thing to notice here is that if I give you a point, let's say I give you this blue point in the total space. Um, okay, so the, the coordinates of this point are f of b and f of d, because uh, one of the birds that simplex pairs was bd. And if I give you this point, and I want to take a path through the total space that you know goes around this circle here. There's actually only a unique way to do this continuously. So and I and I've and I've drawn it with the blue dots. So if I start here at this blue dot, I and I'm going around the circle, I go over here to this blue dot, I go around, and eventually when I get back to the to the place I started on in the circle, I end up at this dot over here, which is not where we started. And similarly, if I start at this red dot and I like take, there's a unique continuous path going around the circle through the total space. Um, and it's it's plotted out here by these red dots. We go around and we end up back here at this point, which is not where we started. So you see things are sort of swapping as we go around. Um, and so this implies that um, there, there is no global section in this bundle at all, because if there was, uh, there would be some there would be some way to go around the circle and, and and ending where we started. But here there's not, so there can't be any global section here, uh, no global section at all. And it's sort of, you know, the intuition is that it's sort of because there's this singularity. Because, um, you know, if I, this is not gonna be rigorous, but you know, if I, if I removed this origin here where there's a singularity, and I just looked at this persistence diagram bundle over the punctured plane, this would literally be a fiber bundle um, where my, my fibers are these two points plus the diagonal. Um, and, oh, I guess when I'm talking about global sections not existing, I'm talking about sort of non-trivial ones. Like, I guess we could, we could have the diagonal. Um, uh, but, you know, from just looking at these two points, right? This this is a fiber bundle where the fibers fibers are maybe just these two points, um, and it's you know sort of well known that if you have a fiber if if this were a fiber bundle over a contractible space, then it would be trivial, right? And so we would be able to like take a global section, um, but because it's not contractible because we're missing this point here, um, we're not necessarily able to do that. 
And so this is sort of why this behavior doesn't happen in vineyards, where we're just looking over R. Because even when I remove, you know, like singularities in R, I'm still left with, you know, a set of contractible intervals. So this behavior doesn't really happen in vineyards, but it can happen in persistence diagram models. And again, that wasn't really rigorous, but, um, you know, this can happen even if, for example, my base space were one dimensional, because if I just restricted this fiber filtration function to like the circle here, of course, we would have the same problem. So you have this sort of interesting structure and behavior that doesn't um, really typically happen in vineyards. And sort of another way of looking at this in sort of a discrete way, or sort of a more combinatorial way is that, you know, here again, I've, I've just listed the birth and death simplex pairs for each quadrant. So um, another way of saying the fact that like, I can't find a global section here or a, a non-trivial global section um, is that there's no way of like consistently choosing uh, one of these pairs in each quadrant in a way where they're like, they're locally matched up in a nice way. So for example, here I've connected in red lines uh, some of these pairs because the pair AC uh, becomes the point represented by AC in the second quadrant, becomes the point represented by BC in the third quadrant. So that's like, if we start here, we go over here, 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 um, eventually becomes BD over here, and we end up not where we started. So this is just sort of a combinatorial discrete way of looking at the same behavior. And and Abby, when you when you say that the point AC in the top right quadrant becomes a point AC in the top left, you're sort of saying as you gradually adjust the filtration values. That's what happens. Yeah, exactly. So I'm saying like if I started this red dot here, um, the only unique way to go over to the next quadrant is by I, I end up here at this red point, and then I end up here, and I'm still at the point represented by A and C. Yeah, that's what I mean. And Jessica, please please go ahead. Hi, I, I have sort of a common comment more than a question, which is that uh, this phenomenon was observed in the case of uh, um, uh, two dimensional persistence for continuous filtering functions. And I thought it was actually um, just a phenomenon that was, uh, that was observable in, um, you know, for persistence relative to sub level set persistence. But here you're doing it in the discrete case. So I was wondering what. Uh, I, oh, I yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because this is totally something that was observed for, for fiber barcodes for two dimensional persistence modules. Right, right. Yeah, right. And, and it's and it is the same. They called it um yeah, they called it monodromy. Um, yeah. um and it and it is like the same phenomenon, and it's sort of the same like thing is happening where we have this like singularity here where we have a point with multiplicity bigger than one. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That's uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that was in the in the multi-parameter persistence, I guess by by filtration persistence in both directions. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let me like switch gears a little bit and talk about how we might compute something like this. Uh because because ultimately I, I hope this is something that's like useful for data science. Um so First of all, I'm going to make a big restriction. I'm going to restrict a piecewise linear fiber filtration function. So what this means is my base space is triangulated. Here it's two-dimensional. Um, I'm given some filtration function on every vertex. And then for every simplex in the simplicial complex that we're filtering, I just extend things by linear interpolation. Um, and this is a big restriction, but I'm going to claim it's like somewhat reasonable. Um, because if you imagine that, you know, we have some data set, usually um, our data sets are obtained either through like numerical simulation or real world data collection. And in most of those cases, um, you're not going to have some filtration varying continuously over the space. You're going to have like a discrete set of parameters where you have a filtration, um, you know, like, for example, if you have a, if you're like in a point cloud that's varying over space, you might only have the coordinates of the point cloud at a discrete you know, set of points in the parameter space. For example, like discrete time steps. So it's sort of natural to only be given maybe vertices or filtrations with the vertices and then extend those linearly. Um, and the way, I, the, the reason I'm requiring things to be linear is because um, 
they were just there's a lot of nice computational geometry work for dealing with things like line arrangements. Um, so it, it lets us take advantage of things from computational geometry. And this is true for gradients too. So uh, I'll just briefly review first how we compute persistent homology. So first uh, we order our symbol C's by filtration value. We construct the boundary matrix. And then we compute what's called an RU decomposition. So this is just we decompose the boundary matrix into a product of matrices R and U, where U is upper triangular and R is this reduced matrix, which means that for any two non-zero columns, um, the lowest one in column J is not the same as the lowest one in column J prime. And here I'm computing homology over the field Z mod two. Um, Okay, and then we can just read off the birth and death simplex pairs. So if I is the low, is the index of the lowest one in column J, uh, then sigma I and sigma J form a birth death simplex pair. And it was, you know, basically, oh, right. And then of course the persistence diagram has a point whose coordinates are the filtration function evaluated on those pair, that pair. So what was observed when people introduced vineyards was that and this is not quite how they present their algorithm, but let's imagine I have some um, filtration function, uh, some time varying filtration function. Here I've plotted uh, the filtration values of five simplices. So it's a very small simplicial complex. And so if I wanted to compute this vineyard, what I could do is I could compute like the initial boundary matrix and then it, uh, some initial RU decomposition at the beginning. And then I could compute the transposition times. Those that is, let's look at the times where the order of two simple C's swaps. So that would be a point like right here, this intersection or this or this here. And the idea is that in between all those transposition times, the simplex ordering is the same. So the birth and death simple C's aren't changing. And so now every time I get to a transposition point, there's like a really nice efficient way of updating the RU decomposition and the birth and death simplices so that when I get to the next interval, I don't have to recompute persistent homology from scratch. I can just reuse my work from before um, to get the new birth and death simplices in the new, in the next interval. Okay, so we're gonna do something uh, like very similar for persistence diagram bundles. So. So remember that stratification I showed you before. So here, because I've made this like piecewise linear assumption, here my stratification is just this partition into polygons here. So here my base space is these four squares, they're triangulated. I don't know if you can see the triangles, but there are eight triangles here. Um, and it's partitioned into polygons or in higher dimensions, polyhedrons, where within each of these polygons, the simplex ordering is constant, which also means that the birth and death simplex pairs within each polygon, uh, those are constant as well. So what we would then do is compute the birth and death simplex pairs in each polyhedron. So we get this sort of template for each polyhedron, and then we can query the persistence diagram bundle. So that is, uh, you give me a point somewhere in the base space and I tell you what the persistence diagram at that point is. So I'm going to go into a little more detail in each of these steps. So first, let's talk about computing that partition. So, oops. OK, so here uh, I, I just have these two triangles. This is my base space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrict my fiber filtration function to just some path that visits every edge at least once. So here's an example of the path. And so this is just uh, you know a one a one parameter fiber filtration function. This is like what we have for a vineyard. And so what I'm gonna do is as I go along that path, I'm gonna, I'm gonna record the places where the order of two simple C's swaps. So that's these vertices here. And I'm also gonna record which pair of simple C's is swapping. So uh, swapping their order. And you can do this because things are, are piecewise linear. Um, you can do this using like a standard plane sweep algorithm. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is, again, be because I've made this piecewise linear assumption, now if I have two vertices on the boundary of the same triangle where the same pair of simple C's is swapping, 
Now I know that they're actually swapping along the whole line. So that means that like, say if sigma has a bigger filtration value than tau in this green area, then sigma is less than tau in this orange, in this whole orange area. And so I can pair up these vertices like this and add all these lines until eventually I get the whole partition in two polygons. And here I really am sort of focusing on the two dimensional case. Um, higher dimensions would be polyhedrons, but here we have polygons. Okay, so here's my partition into polygons. The next step would be computing um, the birth and death symbols squares sure. in each polyhedron. Okay, so I don't want to recompute things from scratch in every polygon. Um, so, but we can do something like we did with vineyards. So I'm going to take some path that visits every uh, polygon at least once. Um, so here's my path here. And I'm just going to start in one of these polygons. I'm going to compute the boundary matrix and RU decomposition in this polygon. And then when I walk over to the adjacent polygon, I'm only swapping the order of two simplices. Um, and so like with a vineyard, there's a nice way of like efficiently updating that RU decomposition and the birth and death simplex pairs so that now we can get the new birth and death simplex pairs in this adjacent uh, polygon. And I mean, secretly, there could be more than one pair of simplices swapping along this edge, but we can just consecutively update things. And so as I'm walking around, I'm just like efficiently updating the RU decomposition and the birth and death simplex pairs, and I'm storing the birth and death simplex pairs for each polygon within, within the polygon. And so I'm not recomputing things from scratch for each polygon. And so now, if I want to query the persistence diagram bundle, um, you give me a point. Here is my point T. I have to locate the polygon that contains it. This is like a really well-studied problem in computational geometry. This is the point location problem. Um, and there are nice ways of like pre-computing data structures that you can do this efficiently if you're querying lots of points. Um, and now, so I've located the polygon that, that contains the point. I know what the birth and death simplices are. And so to get the persistence diagram, um, I just evaluate the filtration function on those pairs of points. And this is really, you know, philosophically not that different from how something like rivet works, except their partition is very different. Okay, so some things that I'd like to do in the future with, with this that I haven't done yet, but I, I hope people will do, is, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the motivating examples was like, we have this, you know, sort of time varying point cloud that's also varying with various like system parameters. So this would be a nice like persistence diagram bundle. Um, or you could look at how the topology is changing over all those parameters. You might also look at like orbits of some dynamical system. Um, to give an example of a different flavor, um, uh, let's imagine we have like an image and maybe I just triangulate all the pixels to get a simplicial complex. Now, if this were like a grayscale image, I could just take a sublevel filtration by pixel intensity. If I have a color image though, um, I might take like a weighted average of the, of the color values, the red, green, and blue color values for each pixel. And for every you know, weighted average, I could take a sublevel filtration. But of course, as you vary those weights, um, you have varying persistent homology. So here, this is an example where the base space is this like triangle here. This is the space where the weights can vary over. And in each vertex, um, I'm, I'm filtering by either the blue pixel values or the red pixel values or the green pixel values. So this is just sort of a simple example of a somewhat different flavor than I've been talking about. So maybe to sum up here, um, persistent diagram models are something that we can use and we have some sort of set of filtrations parameterized by some topological space, like some arbitrary space. Um, and so this, this is, you know, better than before when we can only vary things for an interval in R. Um, uh, we also showed that at least non-trivial global sections may not exist. Um, and this is something that like doesn't really happen in vineyards. And um, I also showed how we can like get this algorithm for like in a nice efficient way, um, computing persistent diagram bundles, at least in the like 2D piecewise linear case. Um, in higher dimensions, which I didn't really talk about much, a lot of things generalize, but 
you know, instead of polygons, you have polyhedrons. A lot of things generalize, except for the fact that if you wanted to implement this, you know, there's a lot of nice, you know, for example, in 2D, um, there's a nice data structure called a doubly connected edge list for like representing a line arrangement, a partition into polygons. As far as I know, and this is not my home field, but as far as I know, uh, this doesn't exist for like arbitrarily high dimensions. Of course, you could sort of imagine something similar, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, so there are things like that that exist for 2D that don't necessarily exist for um, arbitrarily high dimensions, but a lot of it generalizes sort of mathematically, you know, just replace polygon with polyhedron. Um, so some things that would be good for the future are, of course, like actually doing some of these applications that I talked about. Also trying to extend things, the algorithm to the general case. And by that, I don't just mean higher dimensions, but, um, you know, I have this piecewise linear restriction. But in general, you have this nice, maybe you don't have a partition into polyhedrons, but you have this nice like stratification in the generic case. So you can imagine doing something similar where you have this sort of template in each stratum. Um, and I think maybe most important is that what I showed you today was a way of like sort of visualizing the persistent diagram bundle in a very exploratory way. You know, like you give me points in the base space and I tell you the persistent diagram at those points. Um, but I think coming up with nice ways of, of nice invariance uh, for summarizing PD bundles will be important. And lastly, um, I'll just mention that there is not public code available yet, uh, but I am working on it. And so I hope that'll be available sometime in the near future. And okay, so I'll just say thank you for listening. Um, and also there are, there are two preprints on this. The first is basically the first half of this talk. And the second is, um, how, how you compute these. So basically the second half of this talk. So yeah, thank you for listening. All right. So before we get to uh, more questions, let's briefly unmute ourselves and applaud for the speaker. So more questions for Abby. I'll start off. So um, that's cool that you're uh, working on implementing this algorithm or, or you know, repeat releasing it publicly. Um, have you looked into sort of the computational complexity of the algorithm? Are there things you could say there, like worst case running times, things like that? Oh, not off the top of my head. Um, so I think things are like fairly nice. You know, there are nice, efficient ways of like, for example, there's like a Bentley Ottman algorithm for doing that thing where you traverse the path and find those vertices. Um, you know, it's it's pretty efficient to like update. I'm using a doubly connected edge list for like representing that partition and you, and you can like add lines. That's nice. And you can parallelize over the triangles. Um, I think maybe, um, Maybe the mo the limiting factor is maybe memory. Um, because you do have to store the birth and death simplices in every polygon. And for something that's sort of large, you could have a lot of polygons. Mm -hmm. Are there questions? Oh, hey something that is not really a question, but more like um, a comment or um, exploratory comment. So do you see, do you think that there might be some connection to cellular uh, sheaves or co-sheaves? Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. I keep implement I... things, it looks like that type of structure emerges. That's a good question. I don't have a good answer because you're right. It does, it, it feels like there's something that, like a cellular co-sheaf there. Um, it really does feel like that, but I'm not quite sure how to actually use that. Or how, yeah, how maybe, do you utilize that? Do you? Mm, it does maybe. feel like there is sort of a, a cellular co-shaped structure here, though. Yeah, because the stratification that you, you find, right? That, that one is very suggestive mm -hmm. of that. There might be some connections to um, 
I think there was a paper uploaded to the archive fairly recently by uh, Brit uh, Facing and Amit Patel. So uh, I don't know if I can find it on the fly, but I'll I'll try to send it again. Yeah, send it my way. Abby, I was, I was wondering if you could talk more about this. Um, you sort of use a simplifying assumption for much of your talk that the spaces have the same underlying simplicial complex. Yeah. And and when, so when that assumption is not the case, how bad does it get, right? Like if I just try to take the union sort of of all the simplicial complexes that appear and then like say at time infinity, I have, you know, I have the full thing. Can I do something like that or does that sort of get bad? Yeah, I mean, I imagine that you could maybe do something where like you, now your partition includes like regions where the simplex appears. Um, but it's much less, it's much less right. So you don't have to make some assumptions on like the entry points of the simplex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a question in the chatting. Oh, yeah. Um, I can uh, read it aloud unless, uh, if you'd like to read it yourself, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. So my question is on the stability of this generalization of vineyards. You know, if, uh, because one problem with the like classical vineyard algorithm is like, um, is not very stable with the, it, as the point clouds change, um, there seem to be jumps in the homology class representatives, you know, in the resulting vineyards. So I just wanna know if this, uh, you know, the algorithm if presented like overcomes that problem. Thank you. Okay, uh, so that's a good question. So, um, it's sort of well known that vineyards aren't stable. And what I mean by that is something specific. So if you look at a vineyard just as like the point, the just the persistence diagrams, that part, that, that space is stable uh, because persistence homology is stable. What's not stable is the like representation by a birth death simplex pair. Um, that's That's the part that's not stable. So, as in like, if I have two two vines that like come into contact and, and go away, um, things might like swap at that point. And then if you perturb a little bit, they don't swap. Um, so in this case, things are stable in the sense that vineyards are stable, which is that if you're just looking at the space of persistence diagrams, that part is stable because persistent homology is stable. but it's actually in some ways the, the stability problem that vineyards have is almost even worse in higher dimensions because now you don't even have, you know, be, because you don't have those like, because you don't necessarily have those like global sections and persistence diagram bundles, you don't even have necessarily like individual vines in this persistent diagram bundle. Um, so you don't necessarily even have like a represent, you know, a birth death representative for each. Um, you just don't have these higher dimensional vines. Um, so in, in some ways, the stability problem is, is worse in, in higher dimensions or in general. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah, that's, that's actually the question that led to, to looking at whether sections exist in persistence type. Your bundles. Are there any questions? All right. Well, if not, let's end the recorded portion here, though people can free to feel free to ask uh, private questions afterwards. So thanks so much, Abby. All right. Thanks.